Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to my session here. Uh, shift left, uh, test early, test often. I'm William Hurley. I'm the Senior Director of IT at IQ Solutions. Um, and you know, well, I've been developing in Drupal since uh, well, about 15 years now. Did you say 15 years? Yeah. Developing for the web for, for 25, um, lead the... Yeah, that's, that is recording. It's, <laughs> the red is recording. Um, and, uh, you know, at IQ, I lead the application development team as well as our uh, IT and corporate infrastructure teams. Um, and we're hiring. We'll say this again later, but feel free to stop by our, uh, our table. I'd love to talk to, to folks. All right. So when we talk about shifting left, right, the, um, so how many folks have heard of DevOps? Right, this is a big, okay, right. That, that is part of that. The idea is that we move things that are often in the end uh, towards in the specific parts of the process and that are often siloed earlier in the process, give people a, a shared responsibility for these, these items. You know, I'm sure if anyone's been to a, a, uh, a pitch or a conference, they've probably seen something like this, right? You know, the, the idea that you're going to develop iteratively either on a feature basis or on a, a release basis or, or someone where, you know, you have a nice little set of steps you go through and uh, at the end, you know, you launch, right? You know, so that usually looks kind of like, you know, a set of discrete tasks. You go down, right, develop your... your your uh, requirements, <laughs> figure out what those are going to be, design them, develop them, test them, deploy them, rinse and repeat, right? Uh, the problem is, is that, you know, the, the purpose of the idea of DevOps, and I would still argue with, with Agile in general, is to, again, to break down those styles to make everyone um, have a shared understanding of what needs to do and a shared responsibility for what it's going to do. Uh, because otherwise, you know, you end up with a very antagonistic, or you can end up with a very antagonistic uh, thing, right? Developers develop something, and QA people are like, no, this doesn't work. Damn them. Uh, right? Or the operations people are like, you just deployed something that broke, you know, and, and we're no longer, whatever, five nines uptime, right? So the idea that, that everyone has a part in this process is important uh, to, to, to it. Because otherwise, again, you know, you're going to end up with, regardless of when you do the activities, if no one's talking to each other, it's still throwing things over the wall, you're not going to get any of the, the benefits of this. So one of the things, like, you know, and again, it's kind of that classical uh, model, you know, development, there's probably some test case generation and some, you know, and, and things like that. But the bulk of it happens after things are built. And... You know what we're talking about is moving those activities, some of that activity, some of that, you know, some of that attention earlier in the process. Um, you know, to it's not necessarily that it's going to be all the development, right? We say it's happening during the development, and building, and all that stuff, but it's still, it's still people, right? It's still the same, you know, specialists. We aren't expecting, you know, everyone to be like, oh, and now you do this too, because that's not realistic, and that doesn't treat quality like a separate domain, but like it's important. Speaking of, why is it important, right? So this is taken from an actual uh, JIRA uh, ticket. And, you know, that's what, back and forth six times? Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one to have seen something like this on their project, right? You know, it's like things get kicked back. And sure, some of these happen because poor requirements understanding of what needs to be done but also when you deal with complex software changes in one place can easily affect other parts of the system without being aware of them right you know I would expect anyone who's a professional developer to go and test okay does this work does it meet the acceptance criteria but are they going to go and check everywhere else in the site you know that's the sort of thing where it's you know the these changes can affect everywhere so we want to move those back because Changes caught earlier in the process are less expensive. The, uh, from our, uh, our friends over at, the, over at NIST, I'm not sure exactly how they got their methodology, but you know, the, once things are in production, it's a hell of a lot harder to change them, a, lot, a hell of a lot more expensive to change them. 
because that's now you're you're dedicating resource. You're finding that thing. While it may have been out there for a while, so finding the the documentation, finding out what was going on, can be harder. And then also there's there's usually other things that are going on, so you have competing um, priorities. Whereas if you do it right the first time, right for some meaning of the word, right, um, it's going to be a lot easier. You're going to get that into production working the way it needs to uh, beforehand. And obviously, as a developer myself, um, this is a, a kind of, you know, once you push something out, you're expecting it's done. Right? You get started on the next thing. And having it come back to you interrupts what you were doing. You lose focus on what it is. And then you also, oftentimes, there are small things you need to change, it gets kicked back again, right? You, you lose the ability to get into that flow state and provide meaningful solutions. And, and you just end up with a lot of churn. So, um, let's talk about testing here, right? So this is, we're gonna talk about testing, but I also wanna make sure that testing is not QA, right? Quality assurance is the set of tools and processes to ensure, I mean, it says right around the understanding, quality of, of the product. Testing is an important part, right? It's a validation step, but the entirety of, of quality starts early. It's a responsibility, as I said, of everyone on the team to ensure that they are developing a quality solution, you know, thinking about, okay, what could happen then uh, from the developers, developing uh, defensively. Uh, and then obviously the, uh, from a, the, the management side is ensuring there's enough time in the schedule to accommodate the things that have to happen. And then yes, the testing as well. Um, but the uh, I actually learned something new. There is something called, uh, I, I was trying to think of what, what would be a clever name? Dev, what, uh, Dev QOps? Dev QOps? No. But there is actually a Dev QualOps, which feels a little bit uh, hard to say, but you know, maybe it'll catch on. All right, so first is what I think if you're doing any sort of testing, this is sort of the baseline of what you're doing, exploratory testing, right? It's, it's someone going through with, generally without defined test cases, going through the application with an expert knowledge of what needs to happen, trying things. This is often used to determine what those test cases should be, or sometimes it's just give it to the PM and tell them to just click around. Or, uh, you know, what happens if you put minus one in this field, right? You know, so there's, this is sort of the, the, the baseline. And that, this has, you know, this definitely has a place in it, but I want to make sure that it's not just the only thing the team is doing. And there's unit testing, uh, which is kind of at the, the lowest level of software. So that's at the, the function level. If you're doing um, UI, maybe on the component level, Right on the you know uh, uh, like a uh, the twig or, or you know JSX TSX uh, component level, um, but it's the idea that these are can run relatively fast and can with given input you can verify that they meet the expected output, so they don't require the entirety of the application necessarily to run for for that. Um, depending on a framework uh, like Drupal. I find that we, you know, it, you look at a higher, you know, the traditional hierarchy of, of tests, and people will say, write more unit tests than integration tests, write more integration tests than end-to-end -end tests. Uh, and there are a lot of unit tests in Drupal, which is great. I don't run them very often. I only am writing unit tests when I'm writing new stuff. Um, and a lot of things, again, you know, depend so heavily on the state of the database and other things, it's hard to break those down to a unit test where you can actually have those thick, you know, known inputs and known good outputs. So, um, I don't know, there's a question about whether the usefulness in writing unit tests. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a huge TDD fan, but we can have that fight afterwards. So, you know, you might expect, right? Running PHP unit, seeing successes, seeing fails. Uh, obviously, running it on a web core, it's going to be a while. Um, so I don't run it very often, only typically on, on major updates, just to make sure there's nothing else that's, that's going to break there. What was it you say it was running on? Huh? You say it was running on web core? Yeah, on this, is, this is against uh, all the tests within uh, core. Oh. Yeah, yeah so 
it's a lot. It took a while. I don't record exactly how long it took, but it took a long time and uh, not something I'd recommend doing frequently. But you can obviously target more specific ones. You know, if you do a, a module update, target the ones in there. If you have your own stuff, you're changing uh, your own custom module, you can run those and just easily target those. And those, as like I said, the advantage of those is those are generally, unless you're doing a large suite, are going to be fast. Um, and they're going to tell you whether, again, it succeeds for what you think it's going to. Um, so then the next brand is we find ourselves doing the kind of the majority of it, right? And it, at these end-to-end -end tests, right? So some, we have a user flow. My right? user goes in, they perform these actions, and they should get this result across, you know, a set of things. Like a, a traditional one, you know, we've, we work with uh, a number of uh, e-commerce sites. Uh, so a typical one is the user goes in, finds a, a publication, goes to order it, goes through that flow. Now this touches you know, Drupal Commerce, it touch, uh, touches a few different custom modules that adjust that flow, it, it, it uh, obviously Drupal. So it's covering a war, wide swath of the system on something that should happen and needs to happen the same way kind of every time. All right, so we can, uh, you know, typically these are done through recording processes, you know, like, um, you know, we use, um, Ghost Inspector, you can use Playwright, you can use, there's a ton of, ton of services and, and tools out there to do it, but they're generally, again, recorded and played back using, uh, testing either a screenshot, make sure it matches the screenshot, or, you know, certain things in the DOM, right? You're making assertions about what exists on the final output for it. Um, and for my one interactive piece of the thing, you know, just an example, goes through, goes through all these steps, puts the things in there. And if I were this one, you know, if I, like, uh, we have more thorough ones like testing which of these are, are you know, this is just a simple success, right? Um, and then it validated that, uh, you know, the, the order created thing was the title. The, you know, there's separate ones for error conditions, right? You know, verify that these things are required or if you don't put, if you put above this level, certain other things happen. But again, these are, generally like known discovered user flows uh, and, and kind of those test cases are built out alongside the development process. Uh, where am I? Where's my, oh, I lost track of that one. Okay. All right, on to the next one. So regression testing, uh, one thing I would do on make sure is like these, these different types are not uh, they're not orthogonal, right? You don't have, oh, it's a unit test and it's not a regression test, right? Anything you're doing to, to check whether you broke something is a regression test. That can be combined with end-to-end -end testing, often is, right? That's just a tool to get to regression testing. Unit testing, again, very similar to that with the exception like some people build tests ahead of time and then develop to that in a, in a test driven development standpoint. But anything where you're, you, again, you make a change, did do what we intended to, did it affect anything else? Anything else? Regression tests. Again, very important because we're dealing with uh, dependencies that are not in our, under our control, right? You know, everyone here, I'm sure, is going through a, the Drupal 10 update, um, and it's a question of like, okay, what did that affect? Or you know, CKR5, I think, puts HTML out in a slightly different manner, right? You know, like, what does that look like once you edit a page, right? So these sorts of things are important because. What we don't want to have happen is we want, don't want to push something out of production and have a break, right? Because that loses trust. And trust is an important part of this. And likewise, as, as a developer, I want to have a, a, an idea that what I'm going to do isn't, is going to be successful, isn't going to come back to me. Because then my estimates that I provide the team, provide the client, those are going to be wrong. And again, we lose trust, I lose trust. Um, and I always hate, like, someone's like, oh, how long is it going to take? Oh, about, a, about two days. Oh, so we'll tell them five, right? I hate that feeling because that means they don't trust my estimates, right? And oftentimes because they've learned people aren't checking things or enough things as they build. And there's visual testing, right? So it's comparing what the, what the user sees on the screen compared to some usual, like, previous run of it, 
So it's used, again, you know, a lot of stuff, for, and then testing to verify, does it match this known good state visually? And, you know, we talked a little bit about visual regression testing, which is a broad swath of, like, go through the site, go through all these pages, take screenshots, compare it. Did anything change between the last time you ran it and this time? Because that might be a one. So, so you have, like, visual regression testing. Uh, this one here is, is backstop. So, you know, it goes through, takes screenshots, compares them, see the one on the right, there are errors. Uh, in this case, it's, you know, uh, MailChimp wasn't responding, we're looking at that. But you can see pretty easily there is a problem here, and you know where the difference is. The downside, of course, is content changes will affect regression testing, right? So there are also, um, you know, certain rendering things, certain, you know, if, if things are coming in from external sources, they can affect that, so you have to be careful about false positives. Uh, and then security testing, also a very important piece, working for the government, because uh, we always have to be FISMA compliant. Um, and so testing, uh, you know, the uh, software to ensure that it is, it is secure, uh, is, a, is a vital piece of it. Now, in Drupal 8 and up, uh, it becomes even more so than Drupal 7 because Drupal 7, when you had dependencies, there were generally going to be Drupal dependencies, right? They're all, you know, you always had, you know, you, you know what you're updated when you updated a module. In Drupal 8 with, with um, you know, adding Composer in there, your dependencies can come from wherever. They can update a dependency because of security uh, issue, and the module maintainer, where they're getting that dependency, may not know or may not care, right? Uh, that it, it it changed. So, just looking at the what Drupal tells you, it's like, oh, this module isn't, isn't necessarily going to be sufficient. You know, what what is necessary is, is another system to kind of again to check those dependencies. This is uh, GitHub's dependent bot, which is something you have kind of. If uh, you're doing work there, it's pretty easy to enable. Um, there's also ones from SNCC, from, um, and there's a bunch of them, or if you have any tools that generate software builds of material. Um, again, that's gonna tell you all of the dependencies that make up the system, again, and check them against things like, you know, known CVEs and, and other sort of, uh, you know, known issues to do that. Additionally, yeah, I thought I had one in there. Uh, you know, additionally, there are, again, testing tools. They'll go out there, they'll, you know, they'll hit anything with form, attempt to, to put it in, uh, you know, SQL injection scripts. Uh, I've seen things where they're doing, like, um, fuzzing against, against uh, you know, uh, code and stuff like that. Those are, you know, I know the government often does those, right? So you may get reports from them. You know, it's also helpful to do that on your own, especially for non-production things, because, again, you don't want this stuff to go in production. You don't want to get found in production because that loses trust. All right. So what did that, that look like? Nothing. So easy one, right? You're updating a visual uh, visual element, right? You're changing, you know, either a font size. You're adding new uh, new call out or, or things like that. You want to make sure that what you did didn't affect something else. Maybe someone was good on their their selectors. Maybe they. Uh, used a um, you know mix in that you weren't expecting them to, to, to use more broadly than, than it was there. You know these things, as again as, as systems grow, they tend to get uh, accumulate some degree of, of kind of visual cruft uh, in the, the in the style sheets. So you want to make sure that that what you know you change isn't going to affect anything else. So easy, right? That's visual regression testing, right? That's the easiest way to do it. Hits a wide variety of, of pages. Uh, and then obviously anything that you have an end-to-end -end test that's doing comparisons on visuals has to get updated. We'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but it's very easy for test cases to break. And it's just as important to keep up on them because if you if you get in the habit of not, you know, not considering them valid, right? It's like, oh, it's been broken for a month, right? Are you going to trust that it's actually a problem? What about the next thing that break? Oh, it's, you know, it's just another thing that broke. We don't have time to go fix it. It's, you know, if you're going to make tests, 
important to keep up with those tests or they lose their value. So again, you know, the adding new functionality here, right? So it's the, you know, determine, okay, you know, oftentimes in the requirements of the design portion, it's like, what is the user doing? At that point there, you can determine what the, the appropriate method of testing is. So is it going to be unit test? You know, you're creating a new service, it's going to have functions. Those are good things for, for unit tests. Is it just going to be built from, you know, uh, contrib modules, in which case, really no point in unit tests, but that's the place where an end-to-end -end test would be useful. And again, as you build these things, you want to, again, check um, kind of did I affect anything else. You can also, if you know what, you know, if your um, system is broken up to the point where you can identify where things are being used, then you can, again, slim down what you need to run to test it. And the big one of danger of recall. Um, this one here, unfortunately, requires running all the things. Um, and as a result, it's, it can be a very time-consuming uh, process, especially on major updates. Minor updates, you may not, or patch updates, you may not care about running all the unit tests. What, you know, say in this case, oh, check the change log, what changed, run those, right? Run your own custom stuff because deprecation of APIs happens. Um, but probably don't need to run all the things um, for, for smaller updates, but it is important to, to run kind of again visual regression testing and any end to end testing that you have because things change, right? They uh, had one where a variable in a Twig template got changed and all of a sudden our uh, login log outlook uh, links stopped showing up. And, you know, the visual regression testing picked that up. I look at these screens every day, <laughs> right? Would I have seen it? Maybe. Um, it's very easy for subtle changes or, you know, to, to get missed because of that familiarity with something. So we've talked a little bit about here, but some, some important uh, things when you're doing this. Obviously is, you know, we talked about it as like QA as a whole, right? That effort, that attention to it, shifting that left, but it's still you know, there's still verification that's necessary, right? The QA team is still going to need to see, did it pass? And if you have tests that only run on your computer, having them have to then build the environment to test it again is a lot of duplicate and wasted effort. So if there are ways that you can share artifacts, share that proof, again, that it is uh, functional, that it is meeting those tests, that means there's less of that, again, that duplication of effort that happens. And, you know, the, the cost of maintaining. Um, whenever you're modifying something that has a test and you're breaking the test, now you're fixing two things. Right? So um, you can have too many tests, um, but you want to make sure that you're testing the right things in the right way. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up with broken tests that no one wants to go and fix, which, again, degrades the entire point uh, of testing. And the, a big one I've seen is like the, the time for it, right? We talked about running the Drupal core tests take hours. If you have a, a very robust uh, set of uh, you know, tests, it could also take hours. And if you're running these frequently, I've seen people you know, run them on every commit, you're now blocking that deployment process, right? So it's like th consider your throughput uh, and, and you know, maybe, maybe you shouldn't do it on everyone. Maybe it's a daily or whatever ad hoc schedule or, or something when you're combining a number of changes. Um, the, uh, so then the, you know, this obviously gets also to the kind of the duplication part because if, if the QA team is then having to rerun those, again, that's time that those systems are, are running that may, depending again, depending on how your tooling is set up, block other testing activities. Uh, so one important part of this is also consider when you're, when you're designing, this is where it gets to the, kind of the developer portion of it a little bit more, is that, you know, think about how you're structuring your application to make it better, to be easier, more easily testable, right? I, I come back to the CSS a little bit, right? You know, make sure your, your, your components are properly scoped, that your, you know, whatever, whether it's BEMS, whether it's SMACs, whether it's uh, atomic design, whatever it is, 
that you have a hierarchy that you can, you have a pretty good idea that if I change this, it's only likely to affect this section. Yeah, because you want to reduce what you can um, to be able to not have to run everything, every change. And we talk about structuring the ones, right? So it's, it's, you know, you could, on an e-commerce one, you could create one test case that did everything. But then you'd have to run that test case every time, right? And it would probably be a very lengthy one. And especially if it breaks early, then you start having to go through, oh, fix this. Okay, that breaks later, you know. So having, having appropriately scoped tests allow you to, to run them more frequently, often in parallel, as well as discover a wider range of issues that you can fix at once rather than having to do onesie twosie uh, part of it. Um, and another one is, is that, that you're, uh, you know, a lot of modern systems depend on things that are outside of your control, right? You know, um, reca you know CAPTCHA being a big one, uh, use of either Cloudflare is one or, or Google's or whatever. There are solutions to testing those, but they're kind of a pain in the neck, and there's no point in testing their CAPTCHA solution. We're going to assume it works, right? Um, so it's like, you know, if, if, that, if you're formed behind that, you may have to disable it in order to proceed with that, that test. Uh, and likewise, if you're, you're API-driven and that changes frequently, your visual tests are going to get broken every time your data changes. Uh, so you want to, like, ignore that portion of it, you know, don't, uh, you know, any visual regression testing thing has a way to ignore selectors. You can just doesn't even count on the, the, the uh, you know, screenshot or, or fills it with like a, a, in the case of Playwright, a pink box, which I kind of find kind of funny. It's definitely highlighted, but you know, look to, to ways that you aren't again duplicating that effort, testing something that you can't fix anyway, uh, and will just cause your tests to break. All right, well, that gets to the end of the uh, prepared portion of it. Now we go to some, some Q&A, hopefully. All right. So not in terms of, the, of trying to assess the value of testing, so my question is, mm -hmm. but in terms of planning, when you're looking at the time to create features, so they want a new component. Um, without any testing, it, without it breaking and causing more coding. Um, let's say it's going to take eight hours of development and four hours of styling. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be added on to that in, in just a order of magnitude rule of thumb to build testing around that? Right, so if we're doing, so there's, there's <laughs> I hate to say it depends, um, but the, it, it, so if it's just a new visual element, you're going to get your next time you do the visual testing, it's going to come up and you're going to say, yes, this change is accepted. And that now is the, the reference screenshot for it. And from there, any changes or, or, or kind of regressions are going to get verified against that. So that part there is very easy. Uh, if we were assuming sort of a, a larger uh, one, you know, the... I was thinking like unit testing. Unit testing. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, that, that seems... <laughs> Typically. <laughs> yeah, so unit testing is, um, so getting unit testing set up is not fun, but we're going to assume that you, that's already set up. Um, so, you know, if you're, again, you're setting up a new new one, you probably have a service or two with some, some functions it exposes. Um, you know, you said probably about kind of a day and a half sort of time frame. I mean, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, and that I would say probably another, for that granular, probably in a you know fifty percent to to a little bit more add on from that. So you're saying you could take be up to like four or five hours to add on to the eight hours of development. Yeah. Oh. Um, I mean that's just. Is that all QA time or is that between QA? And it's support? yeah, it's it's a little bit of that, right? So it's it's some of it is is determining what what are those test cases, right? What is important to test? Uh, because yes, people always want to see that coverage number go up. But if, if that's in a vacuum, if you're not actually driving benefits for it, all you're doing is writing code to write code. Um, so, you know, and then some of that is, is on the development part to actually, you know, uh, write the tests, write the assertions, 
certainly if you need to scaffold anything out ahead of time. Um, so it, it, it can get complicated after that. Yeah, that's, Oscar. Well, generally, that's true for like your first couple of tests, right, for a new component. But then like, oh, well, what if I change this and put that output? Right. Then, you know, you don't go from one to like half a dozen pretty quick. Right, yeah. So you have the initial investment. Yeah. Yeah, adding additional assertions based on, on boundaries and things like that is usually pretty fast. I do have a question too. Like, Go for it. Do so you use um, static analysis to supplement or replace tests? Have you found that useful? So uh, we do some static analysis. Um, you know, obviously anything like uh, PHPCS and, um, and then, uh, yes, though. I don't always trust the results I get out of PHP Stan. Um, I'm, I'm a convert. I, you know, I've, I've had ones where it um, completely missed stuff that was deprecated in, in going from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9. She finds those. And, or, and then like, from, the, from the PHP 7 to PHP 8, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh yeah, nothing's, nothing's a problem. And then we upgraded and, and we had some, some issues. So I take it with a little bit of grain of salt, but it is important. You know, um, those are useful, uh, again, kind of across the board. The, the downside, of course, is if you want to do that, you're, and you haven't been necessarily good about all of the things, you're going to get hundreds of errors. Um, you know, my favorite one is, it's like, you know, you wrote a service and you used uh, service location, so it's like slash Drupal, you know, rather than having it injected into your, 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 um, your constructor. It's going to yell at you for that. Right, so if you haven't been keeping up on that, it's going to be you're going to get a lot of noise. Chris, so you brought up the dependabot uh, screen. Right? Yeah. So all the little dependencies that come in from Symfony, composer, and stuff that aren't necessarily Drupal. When you're testing those, I said with most of those you don't need, you wouldn't need to do full regression testing. You just kind of pick it apart, test what you need to do, what do you think on that? Yeah, so in that case there, so you're going to see, okay, so what is, whose dependency is this? Right, that's going to tell you, okay, what module or, you know, transitive dependency, like who, who wanted this and what is it going to potentially affect? At that point, it's, you're going to get a little bit, obviously you can run everything, but that's going to take a while. Or you use some expert knowledge to say, okay, what sections of the site could this touch? And run them on that. It's going to depend a little bit on how, what the appetite for risk and timeline is for that time. I'm very interested in visual regression testing, but also, um, you know, backstop JS, but also Ghost Inspector. I saw you had a slide up. Oftentimes, um, as a developer, I'll be making a change to something, and the code's not broken. Everything works as expected. But perhaps the change I made is affecting a template that's being extended by another template. And sometimes it's impossible to know um, without just pouring through, you know, tons and tons of files to know exactly what that change will affect elsewhere in the site. Right. Um, so I, I am curious about tools like Max.js and how useful it would be in a situation where maybe there's a tweak to a custom component, um, or perhaps Ghost Inspector, where I would want to maybe write a test that would allow me to just maybe monitor a certain component or a certain area of the site mm -hmm. without kind of having to record pages and pages. Um, is, is Ghost Inspector versus Backstop JS useful for that? Or is there a yeah, so I mean, those it gets a little bit to what your goal is, right? If you're looking for just, did I break something somewhere else in the site? Visual regression testing is probably the best bang for your buck, right? Because it's, it's, you know, good ones are they're going to spider it, they're going to generate a list of URLs, they're going to visit that, they're going to compare those changes over time. They also, because of that, especially if you're on a, a significantly content driven site, you're also going to end up with a lot of false positives. Because um, your content changed, it's an expected change, and you still have to go, yes, it's expected. All right. Um, the, but what it, the, the main difference is, is, is those things are not going to go through a process, right? They're not going to go past a form. They're not going to take these steps in order. Uh, and if you need to validate, like, this component is functioning in this way, then, then that's going to be, again, or unit tests at a very granular level, or end-to-end -end tests, um, again, to track that, you know, to test that, that user flow. 
Um, in end to end testing, how important is it or necessary to write different variants? Because um, sometimes there's weird behaviors that are caught, like in QA, that, like I don't, I wouldn't have thought to ever do this. Um, but like, can you write, like, if you have like a process, like, to do different things, it might just be a simple checkout form, but. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, QA, the person gets an idea, I'm going to go through this checkout form and then go back to the cart and then go back real quick and it breaks somehow. Yeah, you know, the, 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 uh, the consultant answer is every failure is an opportunity to write a new test. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, yeah, because, yes, you know, the, the old joke is a QA tester walks in a bar, orders one beer, orders, you know, 999,999 beers, orders negative one beers. Right? It, people are going to come up with corner cases that, and this is where I, I, I get a little bit, you know, just want to make sure quality is, is the entire team's perspective because I, I hate the term bug, right? And it was like, oh, we found a bug. Like, is it though? Is it really? <laughs> or is this just the requirements were not sufficient? And that's fine. That happens, right? You know, whenever I ever ask the question, well, what happens if you put negative one in there? Um, so it's, it's, Hopefully, someone like that basic level of it. But you know, it's very easy to not think about what would happen if someone did this thing. Um, and you know, that's a that's a defect, right? It's a defect, probably in requirements, or maybe in design. If defect is in implementation, certainly, uh, is possible, right? So, you know, you it's very difficult to get those get complete coverage out of the gate. I think that that's that's not a good what you should be shooting for. You should be shooting for, like, does this do what we said it was going to do? Maybe some other things, like some basic, um, you know, tests. That's where exploratory testing comes in, right? Someone is going to go and do these things. And those are like, okay, well, let's find the thing. Let's write the test that would have found this behavior. Part of the reason you don't have those tests is because developers test to pass, QA people test to fail. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Huh. Uh, so, what was it? Five years ago, I was all stoked on Behat. I mean, um, uh, like we can, we can, you know, you can set up and you can write the tests in a English language like way, and it'll. Do, and we did that. I remember doing that hardcore on one project. And the problem is, is the developer still had to write the tests. Um, and at that point, the language is not as, as expressive as PHP is. And you find yourself right, oh, now I have to write a plugin that exposes this so we can write the test that uses it. At that point, why are we doing it that way? Um, you know, so my experience is, is, has not been good on, on, on BHAT. Um, that's why I prefer, if we're abstracting it, just use something that can record, can play it back, and then you can at least broaden the set of people who are writing those tests. You again, Oscar. Do you run your tests against production? No. Um, scratch that. We run some tests on production, but those are primarily a, is it still working? Part of it. We're not running the full suite of them again because those could be potentially destructive, right? Because they're tests like, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to add content, you're, or, you know, this is all. Add an order. We're not adding orders in production. So that would really confuse people. Um, but is the system working? Can we get search results? You know, those are tests that we're running, but we're also running those in production because we depend on an external service that may go away because external services have a tendency to do that. Um, and so there, there's a I didn't cover those as far as the testing part. Actually, there is one joke. We do, we do often do security testing in production because that's not just the application that's required. It's also the infrastructure that needs to be uh, tested. Uh, so that would be an exe uh, exception to that. Yes? So you don't recommend VHAT necessarily, but what tools do you recommend? Um, yeah, so, so unit tests, obviously PHP units, the one. Um, the, uh, personally, I've liked uh, Playwright, uh, which is a um, open source end-to-end uh, -end testing tool. 
Uh, it's written by Microsoft, but it's built on top of Chromium, but it can also uh, run Firefox. Um, and again, it has a recorder, but it also has a robust API. You can write tests in, you know, pick a you know, JavaScript, TypeScript, whatever you want there. Um, so, and then, so we use Ghost Inspector, but it's a very similar thing, right? To, you, you can um, construct their test cases using their, I think they use a YAML format to do the stages and stuff like that, but it's generally just easier to record. Um, and then maybe modify some stuff uh, to get different variables after that. Um, and then on the, I know a bunch of folks have used Selenium. Um, I had a bad experience testing a Java app with Selenium. It, you know, it bit me as a kid. So uh, <laughs> I'm told it's better now, but uh, you know, was it once bitten, twice shy sort of thing. Um, and then on the, the regression testing, uh, we use Backstop. I've looked at uh, Wraith, I think is one that BBC has. There's a, a number of different tools, uh, again, some commercial, some open source. Um, I feel there's a new testing platform you know, every time I look at these things. And Cypress, I think we had a lot of people because we had a lot of people work with Drupal 10, mm. trying to use Cypress. Yeah. Yeah, those are perfect with Drupal 10. I think that Mink extension has a simply different, it's a simply four dependency. Oh, Mink. <laughs> People who spend a lot of time on some VM. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, there's some, <laughs> some links I mentioned there. Just one question. Yeah. What's your opinion on TDD? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not a big fan. Um, so, I guess if I were building a product, then yes. However, we're not. We're building on top of something that we assume, you know, that it, you know, in a large portion of, of most uh, sites are using out of the box or contributed stuff. So there's nothing to unit test, right? You're not, you know, and then it's really hard. You, it's really hard to come up with those end-to-end -end tests ahead of time and verify, right? You know, so you you. I'm not, a, yeah, as I said, I'm not a big fan of it as a methodology when dealing with Drupal sites. All right. Got just a couple minutes. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, and, uh, you know, our HR folks, again, want us to know we are hiring. Uh, is that now?